introduce Dr. Godiva and then we can get going. Thanks, Emmanuel, for that. Uh, <clears throat> well, greetings, everyone. And um, when Emmanuel suggested that we do something on money and debt, of course, I agreed. Those are not hard to, to ignore. And uh, those are always on the table for discussion, as with any educational institution, which is what the Asia Institute is, which is nonprofit uh, out of Washington, D.C. and Seoul. So money is, I say money is an interesting and necessary figment of the imagination and in this endlessly discussed. And so we generally conduct seminars and web and webinars and those have become more prominent of um, presentation and the, the scope that you were able to pull into that. And Nika, I'm really fascinated by this area that you're discussing here of, of the value and how that's transmissible. And, and it's not just, uh, you know, like a market and, uh, you know, like, I guess the Da Vinci's and all of that, but you mentioned the Zapatistas and the, the value of art and access to markets and all that. It's re really fascinating. I'd like to hear more discussion in a few minutes. Um, my, my comment is on um, two things that are really dovetailed together. Uh, one is the fact value dichotomy and the other is scientific economics. Uh, both of which by now have uh, completely collapsed, as Anne uh, pointed out, and then as um, Steve gave the empirical information. Uh, but I'll say that the topic of money never ceases to cause a lot of uh, discussion, disagreement, desire, war. Uh, and this is particularly interesting when, when physics and time and debt come together at, at a particular point in history. Um, like, like, for example, right now. Uh, and it, it's a topic I think that all adults ought to have some knowledge about since it's by agreement that we have money. As, as Ann said, it's a promise. And, um, and, and when we talk about philosophy, Stanley Cavell, that was a philosopher at Harvard, said that uh, philosophy is really education for adults. And I think political economy should be a core subject which is why we ended up with this uh, uh, discussion today. Uh, personally, I think philosophy, and I think Nika will agree with this, that it can be simplified to uh, human beings trying to make the world more intelligible. Uh, economics, philosophy, all of these are you know, discussions that are happening uh, in real time, and also about history, of course. Everyone does this to a degree, I say, um, and I think that it's correct to say that we learn from all commentary in all areas of society. And I don't mean to say that we have to accept all things that are said practically, of course. Uh, to begin with, there are some assumptions in economics that I think are not only bad philosophy, but detrimental and dangerous to humans and species and to nature generally. Um, and I had looked more deeply into this probably a decade ago and into the topic of money, uh, particularly with David Graeber's 5,000 Years of Debt that Ann mentioned, and also uh, Hillary Putnam's The End of Value-Free Economics, where he brought together, you know, Amyarta Sen, uh, Barbara Nussbaum, and uh, his own work on the entanglement of facts and value uh, and theory. So after the Great Recession in 2008, I was watching and experiencing both uh, the recession and the rise of social media. And I could see that there's this issue of actual cash money. So what David Graeber would call, called the um, rough and ready money. People didn't have the money to get by on and the banks were all locked up also. Uh, it was serious and even existential, of course. And there was great desperation. A lot of that starting to come back now and has been, of course, through, through COVID for regular folks. And all of this, of course, can be expected as this kind of unseen crisis uh, was about debt and value. So that's why Emmanuel called this uh, unseen and seen crisis uh, for our topic today. Uh, all of these, of course, go together, right? So in the last century, money and value and human psych psychology collided with physics and nature. And of course, we can all see generally now, and we're suffering the outcome of that, uh, as, um, as intimated earlier, we're in a fix. 
so some assumptions I want to point out within the system today, and I'm going to run through this quickly so we can get to discussion. Uh, we can call the system capitalism, socialism, some combination of that, financialism, whatever. Uh, what is certain is that innovation is plummeting, real investment drying up. When I mean real investment, I mean manufacturing, like actually doing something. And then there's a deluge of nonsense and scope like never before because of, of course, social media. Not that that's totally bad. And uh, quote, uh, one systems philosopher, Bonita Roy, said to me at one point, kind of obviously, nobody has any money, right? And then there's bad philosophy or what Hillary Putnam called the dangerous legacy of logical positivism, which is the core of what I'm talking about. Logical positivism is, of course, strictly an empirical view. So basically, for something to be real and rational, it has to give us a sense, impression. An observer over here and kind of like dead nature or matter over there. Or it would be like something like a fact is like an alligator in the room. It's a sense impression, right? You can see it. Whereas a value is uh, a value, something like the word coherence is, uh, even if it's epistemic, doesn't give a sense impression. It's therefore not open to rational uh, discussion. This, this is the dichotomy that has broken down. Um, I think we can discern facts and values, but they're entangled together. They're not separate. The, the technical term is uh, alethic pluralism. Uh, but the position is basically pragmatic or post-pragmatic. Uh, so there, there's four assumptions that I want to point out. One is the assumption that human nature is red in tooth and nail. The other is the assumption that the economy is scientific, not political. The third is the stupid humans assumption. And the fourth is that humans are basically mental robots. Now, remember, back just 300 years ago, humans are just the mechanical robots, right? but today it's mental robots. Um, let me give a couple comments on each one of those. So for example, the, the philosophical underpinnings of what we have today is coming from Hobbes and Rousseau. That's what we call ourselves moderns. Um, and they basically uh, ignore sociobiology up through the 19th century and even into the 20th century. You don't really hear about it. It's not taught very much where the idea of evolution was everybody fighting each other, uh, survival of the fittest, but they of course didn't read Darwin or they didn't quote him where survival of the fittest has to do with the, the outcome of progeny, right? So the, the outcome of progeny that, that are put forward. I'm not saying that we deny violence or competitive conditions, but uh, when we look at the actual evolutionary evidence, we're talking about uh, philosophy, not, not science. Today, of course, uh, you know, the evolutionary biologists would acknowledge that cooperation has to be the basis. And very likely, we might say that that's human nature, that I don't think that we can actually get at human nature is too complex. But we could say that, you know, actually evolutionarily wise, we have to have com com uh, cooperation to the basis of society and then competition later. Uh, that's the human nature argument. The assumption that the economy is scientific and not political, well, this is, uh, it's interesting because in the sciences, there are positive and normative science and, and philosophy, and there are value judgments, uh, but these are said not to be in economics. And interestingly enough, Steve had uh, alerted me, Steve, Professor Keen here, had alerted me a couple years ago that even, that the core economists are actually saying something like um, 80 or 90 percent of the economy occurs indoors and thus they argue climate change is not a problem uh, and these are people with influence i mean the people that are actually making the policies that are enacted and um, the, the fact of their view is actually a large step away from even a scientific economy right and it's hard really to even say much other than it's false and it's uh, socially it's delusional uh, the third is the stupid humans assumption. Basically, it goes like this. Early people were basically stupid and did barter and rudimentary exchange. They were superstitious, while we are enlightened and reasonable moderns. Uh, reasoning takes hard work and has not come by easily. It's been done all through history. 
And this goes for science, discovery, invention, and innovation, which are not just out of the 16th or the 17th, 16th, 17th century. <clears throat> People of the past were quite capable. And when it came to money specifically, it was, uh, as, as Anne mentioned, going back to the Sumerians 5,000 years ago or more, it, it was virtual. You know, it was, uh, they were moving uh, those silver bars around in the palaces and the temples. And uh, Graeber and the anthropologist reported all of this. It's a long history that was somehow missed by the economists. And another interesting history that's been missed is that innovation and discovery brought all kinds of products by you know, all throughout history, but particularly automated products you know, a couple hundred years ago. Uh, and, uh, and we kind of want to ask, where did the future go, which is something that uh, David and Peter Thiel uh, debated. And I had written to David about this a while back. It was interesting, that, that particular debate. And finally, the assumption that humans are mental robots, that hum basically human beings quantify all interactions, which we don't. We quantify certain transactions, but not all interactions. So let's say, for example, I say to my wife, she's sitting here beside me, so, um, I'll pay her to take out the trash. She's going to look at me pretty strange, um, certainly. But what if I were to say to her, I want to pay her for taking care of ch our children? Uh, in the latter, I'm certain to receive divorce papers tomorrow on two counts. One is an insult, insult to her humanity, as she's looking at me right now. It's an insult to her humanity and nature, human nature. And two, it's an insult to the relationship or quantified transaction over uh, qual quality and human interaction. And this basic humanity, I, I use this example because it, it illustrates the point of course, we can't be familiar with everybody, right? So we have to have some kind of exchange system. But this cooperation also does scale out to society. Um, it's these reasons that modern thinkers like Sin discuss the uh, schizophrenia of Adam Smith, and they do it rhetorically. Uh, because for anyone who's read Adam Smith and on whom which uh, Amyarta Sin is an expert, um, the schizoid view is coming from today not from Smith. Uh, these are some of the core assumptions in bad philosophy that lead to the economics and nature of value judgments therein that create a propensity towards a certain attitude in society. And this is why we see, for example, Ayn Rand fanatics going on about property rights and the market and competition as fundamental human nature. And then, of course, Ayn Rand going to the um, the military academy and saying that uh, basically we ought to eliminate the Native Americans because they they based on uh, nature as an economy and they didn't have property rights. That's the that's the crazy outcome of some of this thinking. So the the attitude is not uh, it's not a natural attitude. It's a synthetic according to a particular political economy is the argument. And as capitalism and markets grew there was a disentangling maneuver of this entanglement between facts and values uh, that the economy operates as something out there and independent. Um, remarkably, that, uh, that economy out there and independent served powerful needs against the natural argument that would be invoked as a human basic value of uh, comparing utility. Uh, now this this, I'm going to end here, but this, uh, uh, this encounter with logical positivism that came into economy, uh, uh, Hillary um, Putnam says it came from uh, Lord Lionel Robbins, the major economist during the Depression, where, of course, there's no reason to mention Marx, in my opinion here, because the material dialectic is gone. Uh, what Robbins' position uh, was that it basically left him as unable to agree with the redistribution of income during the depression based on logical positivism. Yet he didn't deny that there was an entanglement or basically that the dichotomy of fact value was essentially a farce. Uh, what he didn't do is he connect, didn't connect these two together in an argument, which is the same thing that Quine did years before, okay, or, or well, around the same time actually. So uh, 
these are not small matters when it when in the real world where people suffer and nature is being destroyed we ought to give serious attention to the case at hand entanglement is an actual uh, real case um and there's no time to go back and dis discuss uh, Hume and the is ought and so forth into the philosophy, which can be done always later. Um, but the the basic idea there is that when you have uh, economic outcome, if you just let the market run, and uh, what they said at the time was you can't uh, see Anne shaking her head because she knows the story that you could not say. Uh, that there's a comparison of utility of the individuals that were affected within that system. So um, based on his lifelong inquiry and to what I discussed today, Hillary Putnam called for a third enlightenment. Uh, the current turmoil in the world seems to be something of the sort as these tectonic plates of society and worldview change, similar to the Copernican revolution that's, that Steve mentioned. Uh, will it break down into a new eco-humanistic arrangement? We don't know. But anyway, without these holistic and intuitive understandings, we wouldn't have much intelligibility of the world. And if language is just word games, then science would be completely nonsense. This begs the question, obviously, of why science actually works and our language has some accuracy. Uh, let me com conclude with that comment uh, that the uh, the fact of the outcome of even a cursory look in money and scientific economics will show that the economy is a political matter and that a deeper look will show that the matter of human psychology and philosophy concerning how we interact with each other and interrelate is uh, with each other in the natural system. So that these are matters of uh, human psychology. Um, as mentioned, it looks as if we are in another upheaval and this time far larger than in the past and with far more information and people involved and at the same time with real existential threats such as nuclear weapons, climate change and economic breakdown. Thanks a lot.